And I run something called the Race Card Project where I ask people to send me their six word stories about race, inclusion, identity, culture. And there's one six word story that I think is relevant to this conversation. It was a woman from Tampa sent in six words, um, asked for equality, we got integration. Mm. Mm. They're two different things. So if we could sort of begin there and looking at what, you know, this, what came out of the civil rights struggle. Well, civil rights struggle was for equality, was for jobs and education and opportunity. But because there was an, such an emphasis on integration that what got lost sometimes in that mix was equality, was actually creating systems of equality. So Doreen, I'm gonna begin with you. The difference between those two things and the, 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 the distance and where we perhaps lost our way in mm. reaching for one and forgetting about the other. It's a profound six word statement. The way I think about it is we got political inclusion on the one hand, so we got the formal rights, particularly in the South, to vote and participate, but not economic citizenship. Mm -hmm. And that's what we've seen the last 50 years. So there's still been exclusion and marginalization from the labor market, the increase in mass incarceration as the previous panel talked about. And frankly, if you look at many of statistics today, so the unemployment rate is still double for blacks than it is for whites. There's in, they're increasing barriers to job access. And then when you look at job quality, as again the previous panel, especially Wendy was talking about, who gets the good jobs and who doesn't? So yes, has there been an expansion of the black middle class in the last 50 years? Partly, there have been some gains, especially in the public sector. But if you look at the way the labor market has changed and where, if you look at the entirety of black working people and where they are in the labor market, crappiest jobs, low wage poverty jobs. There's a small number of folks that have access to good jobs. Mm -hmm. But for the majority, crappy jobs, and that's related finally to the lack of economic mobility. So when two out of three black kids who are born poor are guaranteed to stay poor, that's called a racial caste system. That's not mm -hmm. democracy, mm -hmm. that's not mobility. So I would say we got inclusion in the formal political sense, but that was it. We didn't get redistribution. We certainly didn't get reparations, Mr. Robinson. And we certainly didn't get economic opportunity and mobility in the same way that many whites got in the same period. Julianne. I think the challenging thing about the question you raise is that in terms of integration versus equality, is that what you, we've begun to see is a diminishing uh, set of opportunities for everyone, mm -hmm. which causes what you so brilliantly captured in your race cards project, I just love that, um, is this white resentment. So from your eyes, you can see a more integrated space. You can look at the Congress, the, the Senate. Yeah, I mean, the Senate. You have three black people in the Senate. I mean, when have we last seen that since Reconstruction? But at the same time, you have this enormous white resentment because they believe that somehow someone is taking something away from them. And what we lose is the notion, which Dr. King captured so brilliantly and so frequently, about the structure of capitalism. He said one time, he said there are 40 million poor people in America. And what kind of country creates 40 million poor people? Mm. He said, when you look at that question, you ask a question about the very structure of the economy. Mm -hmm. He goes to say, you see, who owns the oil? Who owns the iron ore? If the world is two-thirds water, why should we pay water bills? Now, don't send that to the water company. It won't work. <laughs> I promise you, it won't work. But the point is that he's looking at the structure of capitalism. And what we have to say about capitalism now is that it's become much more predatory. Mm -hmm. So it's a racist, mm -hmm. sexist, predatory capitalism. Someone called it plantation capitalism on the last mm -hmm. panel, but I'll call it predatory. Here's why. If you look at economic recoveries, um, I got some numbers up in here somewhere. But if you look at economic recoveries, if you look mid-century, the bottom 80% of people captured roughly 60% of the economic recovery. Top 10% captured the, the other 40%. It wasn't their share. But now the last recovery that we're experiencing now, the top 10% captured 115%. 115% 
of the proceeds of the recovery. Mm -hmm. Bottom 90% captured, lost 15%. And so we have these people running around bragging about the low black unemployment rate. And every time that orangutan says that, I just want to go ch -ch 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 -ch. First of all, when he said it at the State of the Union address, the next day it went up by a full percentage point. A full percentage point the next day. So the, the January unemployment rate was 6.8, but for February, black unemployment was 7.7. .7. Give me a break, fool. Don't you know how this stuff works? But the more important thing is to look at the employment population ratio which I think in the previous panel they talked about the percentage of men, and especially of black men, who simply do not have jobs. Mm -hmm. So you will go into um, a city like Memphis, like New York, in New York City, what they found, 58% of the brothers had jobs. The, um, Cleveland, you're hovering at 50. So half of the men, and women work. Black and white women have very similar employment population ratios. Um, that's just because sisters always work. We don't know any better. We just work. <laughs> I mean, Rihanna, you just got to work, 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 work. Um, <laughs> but essentially, when you look at this male gap, it really speaks to economic structure and what was said earlier about unions and all of that. So you could have the appearance of integration, and that's simply the appearance of integration. Mm -hmm but you don't have the reality of equality. And we won't until we deal with these issues of economic structure. It is highly unpopular to talk about economic structure. Even black middle class people with some sense, some sense, um, went to the best schools and everything else. You can say two things to them that will make them nervous. You can say reparations, they start scoring. <laughs> or you can say capitalism. Or if you say social, oh Lord, if you say socialism, they're going to put some holy water on you and pray on you because really you're a communist. And really, if you look at the structure of capitalism, it's because some of these folks do benefit. Mm -hmm. Do benefit. When we look at what's happened in the structure of wages in the United States, about in, in, in the last, I don't know, about 10 years, we've seen the number of black people with incomes over $200,000 increased by about 3%. Mm -hmm. Not a huge increase, but it's an increase. You see a 7% for white folks, so you know, of course, we don't ever get the same amount, but we also saw the poverty level either stay the same or go up very slightly. But those folks who are benefiting from capitalism are not likely to be critics of capitalism. Mm -hmm. So we'll return and we'll talk a little bit more about the structure of capitalism, but to my right is someone who does not squirm when you talk about reparations or the systems of capitalism. I would like to hear from you about the the difference between those two things and why we seemed as a society to reach for one integration but lose our sight oh. yeah. or lose our way in reaching for the other equality. Well, the short and simple answer is that our ancestors worked for over 250 years. They were not paid. We built the White House. Mm -hmm. We built Georgetown University. We built the Capitol. We hoisted the Statue of Freedom that is above the Capitol's dome. But we were not paid. And so it's, it's almost like starting a race where you hold the black runner back. And you let the whites go because in 1860, the slave force was estimated to have been worth about $4 billion. They were never paid. Mm -hmm. And so I was born in 1941. And my brother Max and I used to go to the uh, movies, used to all uh, on Sundays go down to Jefferson Davis's house and throw rocks at it and run like hell. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And we would go to the, uh, to the movies and I remember a scene uh, uh, a movie 
about the Queen of Sheba mm. with a white woman in the starring role. Mm. She was an Ethiopian woman. <laughs> she was Ethiopian. Uh, it's, it's, I didn't see the movie of Moses with his wife, Zipporah. Mm -hmm. But she was a black Ethiopian as well. And so not only did we lose the value of our hire in slavery, we lost our memory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There is nothing more tragic for a group people to lose their memory of their culture, their customs, their languages. There's nothing more tragic. Someone once said to me, uh, uh, the way out is the way back through. Mm -hmm. And it is so true. You know, it's if you can't remember where you've been, it is very difficult to know where you're going. And so we weren't able to know when I was a little boy in Richmond, Virginia, in segregation. We weren't able to know that a pharaoh had built 5,000 years ago the Great Pyramid. We weren't allowed to know it. Uh, we, we, if Frederick Douglass had been caught escaping slavery, he would first have been whipped with a leather whip until he had bled. Mm -hmm. If he tried it again, uh, he would have um, uh, an aura broiled into his cheek. If he tried it again, they would cut his ear off. If he tried it again, he would have been castrated. Tens of thousands of people suffered this fate. And we hear Frederick Douglass's voice now because he fled successfully. Mm -hmm. But think of all of the great geniuses who were lost. Think of all of the people who were lost in the Middle Passage. Up to two million people died at sea. No reparations, we give them to Jews, we give them to the Japanese, we give them to Native Americans, but for African Americans, no reparations, nothing. And it's, it's, it's like you, you started a race and you told us to wait in the starter blocks, hold back, mm -hmm. while the white runners are off and going. And then you take a pistol and shoot the black runner in the leg. Mm -hmm. And then you tell him, now run. We can't catch up. You will never catch up until this country comes to terms with itself and its idea of what the democratic ideal is supposed to mean. So you say that a community is crippled in some way if they do not know their history. And when you say that, you're speaking of the black community, but I wonder if that applies to America writ large. No, because the history that you're speaking of so eloquently and so visually in a way that that image is in our minds and we now can't forget it, 
But that's not necessarily taught in our schools. That's not, you know, America is the, the land of the free and the home of amnesia. <laughs> we, we do not embrace this history. We do not examine this history in the way that we, ex I mean, we were, if you look at the bestseller list any week, six of those 10 books will be about history, but not about this history. So d does, that, does that apply to the country as a whole in order for us to really address systems applies, of applies, inequality? We have to fully understand. Applies to the country as a whole. When I was a child in Richmond, Virginia in the 1940s, everybody said this expression, from here to Timbuktu. Mm -hmm. I couldn't find a person who knew where Timbuktu <laughs> was. <laughs> what is Timbuktu? But it was a great city in ancient Mali, mm -hmm. the home of a great university with two massive libraries where literatures are now molding. Africa had a glorious history. But when, <laughs> when, when Africans were offloaded at Jamestown Landing in the 1600s, they were Africans. When I was born in 1941, I was a Negro. What? What is up with that? <laughs> <laughs> Some anonymous white person decided that I was a Negro. I was no longer an African. And so when I went uh, down the street one day. I was on Lee Street and I looked up and it was the first African Baptist church. I said, well, what is up with this? What first African are we talking about here? This church was, was founded in 1841 by freed slaves and an enslaved people. We founded it, but none of us knew the story that was ours. And we didn't know it because we were denied it. Another thing Frederick Douglass would not have done had he not escaped to freedom he would never have learned to read because reading was illegal for slaves. In 15 states. And, yes. And in Frederick Douglass was interesting also because in his time he was literally the most photographed American. He knew that years later, there's a, again a wonderful book about this that is a big coffee table book. He had his picture taken than any, more than any other American, more than presidents, more than robber barons. He knew that in the future people would need to see someone like him because he was a unicorn. He was such a rarity. You know, Michelle, I want to, Randall talked about, and just so eloquently, I just really, Randall, thank you, <laughs> but talked about what was taken from us in terms of ritual and memory. And in his work on reparations, you know, basically focuses on what we was taken from us in terms of enslavement. But the other piece of the history that we have to look at is post-enslavement, what was systematically taken from us. We had a piece of legislation that was passed, the Homestead Act mm -hmm. in 1862 was passed. Um, between 1862 and 1924, uh, 270 million acres, 10% of all continental U.S. land was given to white immigrants. We got very little of that. That's what we used to call the Go West Young Man Act. So our economic history also demonstrates the absolute need uh, for reparations, 
the app, because we won't catch up. People like to tell black people, if you save more money, well, if you save more money, you'd probably individually be better off. But if you save every penny you had and never had another new pair of shoes, that wouldn't work for me, um, <laughs> you, we would still not catch up. Because we can't catch up with, with, with the, the 244 years of stolen wages. There are several other periods. I, won't, I know you've got a question, but I, I just want to remind us of this economic history that white people don't pay attention to with the GI Bill. Mm -hmm. Fewer That's than 1,000 black you. men, to the future. Uh, fewer than 1,000 black men in Mississippi got to go get BA degrees. Fewer, the number is 600 and change. Mm -hmm. They, when these brothers went, they had served their time like everybody else did. When they went, you, but you still had to, in the southern states, go through a state board. When they went, they said, oh, no, you can go to barber school. Um, you know, we'll send you to a community college. Uh, meanwhile, we know that some of our icons, like Andy Brimmer, Brimmer Ralph Bunch, others, they got their doctorates on the GI Bill, mm -hmm. you know, at, at Harvard. But, but they were north. Many yeah, they were, north. they were not from Mississippi. I mean, Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, you know, these states just systematically, they were last to integrate. All the progressive legislation that was passed in the 1920s the, and under FDR excluded us. So minimum wage laws, they all excluded us. Private household workers, black women. 70% of us were maids in 1940. So this, this is our history, is, is the sense of exclusion. And the inner cities that we have now, and some of the valuation of them are partly a function of discrimination inside the Fair Housing Act, which said that integrated communities, the no, Fair Housing Act did not encourage integrated communities. So basically wrote red lines around our community. So we, we lost, you know, we've lost so much in, in the very short run, but we've also lost a lot because of contemporary public policy. So if we look at wealth, in 1880, Black people had $1 for every $36 that white people had. By, um, these, the, I'm, I know everybody does not like numbers and everybody knows I love them, but these numbers are instructive for a number of reasons because it talks about what we also had and what we lost. We got down to one in 13 by about 1920, 1910, 1920. We're at one to 13 now. So we got from 136 to one to 13 between 1880 and 1920. And now we're in the same place. And you mentioned the two things that are, are big drivers of that, education and home values. Yes. Um, and delivery, you know, Brother Man um, talked about the investment in segregation. And I think that that's really, that was just such an important point to make. And incarceration being, you know, the third leg on that stool. But, but housing is important and interesting and perhaps under-examined. Absolutely. Uh, because we, we know that for most Americans, a good percentage of their, their wealth is tied up in middle their Middle class home. people, the, in, the majority of middle class wealth is in home, is in home ownership. And we lost, we in 19, uh, 19 in 2000 and about six, nearly half of all black people own their homes. Now it's down to 42%. This is what the Great Recession did to us, specifically to our communities, specifically because of um, discrimination in banking. Too many of our people had um, subprime mortgages. And now the devil's in, 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 in the capital. Um, they, they want to roll back regulation on financial institutions. They want to roll back Dodd-Frank. Mm -hmm. They have essentially uh, kneecapped the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, essentially simply kneecapped it. So now they put Mick Mulvaney in charge of it. He's also in charge of OMB, so he's not paying that much attention anyway. But they basically put zero in the budget for it, which means they want to eliminate the agency that Elizabeth Warren worked so hard to get established and that President Obama worked so hard to get you basically to give some oversight to. So you, we're literally seeing, I mean, those words predatory capitalism, you just have to underline them in your mind because what those people are doing is essentially taking from the needy to give to the greedy and un basically not protecting people, Dr. King would be hollering. I mean, he speaks to all of this in the book that you held up. Right. That, that book, people, I mean, do not let anybody tell you that Dr. King was singing Kumbaya. No. I mean, he might have sang it once or twice. But, uh, and and but that book was, was sold out for weeks. It is now available again. They just yeah. did another printing Be, of it. Because it's such a brilliant, and he really just talks about these structures and the way that capitalists prey on people 
and the ways that these institutions prey on people and what white people would need to wake up and understand, they need to get woke, y'all. White folks in the audience, get woke. Because just like they prey on communities of color, they finna prey on you. Mm -hmm. You know, who goes to, as an example, for-profit colleges? Women, but women of all races tend to be uh, what they call untraditional students, single moms, GIs, the former military, and formerly incarcerated people. Mm -hmm. uh, Betsy DeVoid, that stands for devoid of good sense. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but she wants to lift the regulations that restrain these for-profit colleges. Now, President Obama had restrained them, said you can't just give these loans to people because these people go to these schools, they run up these loans, but they end up with no skill, with nothing. They don't even teach them coding, which you can teach easily. Um, so, but she wants to roll that back because that's where her money comes from. And this is what that man puts in the Department of Education, but we can go department by department by department and see essentially the empowering of the predatory capitalist class. You know, when in, in our home, when we have big family gatherings, we sometimes literally put something on the table that needs to be discussed. Mm -hmm. So with this table in front of us, I want to think of putting things on the table that need to be discussed. And you're talking about predatory lending, but I'm ta I, I want to think about capital, access to capital, because, you know, again, the image that you painted for us is in my mind. The, the words you said, we will never catch up. Yes. Never is a word. I, I, I've never liked the word never. You know, I, I, and that's just the optimist in me um, you know, and sometimes you're like Sisyphus with a smile. You know, you, you keep pushing that rock up the hill because you believe it can happen. But access to capital is a big piece of this mm -hmm. in terms of housing, in terms of education, in terms of business. If you look at the, the research, I'm going to give a shout out to, to Derek Hamilton and Sandy mm -hmm. Darity and the fantastic the work they do. If you are a person of color and you have advanced education, you are likely to get access to credit on worse terms than a white American who has no more than a high school education. Mm -hmm. How do you explain that? How did we get here and how do you untangle that? Oh, you're looking at me now? Yes. <laughs> this question? <laughs> I will start on this one and then I want to put something on the table too. Uh, so I think there's, there's no, we've been having this conversation in many ways about history and what I like to think of as the racial rules. Mm -hmm. um, so the racialized policies we have enacted from the beginning. So I will, I will absolutely come to your question. The way I think about it is in three numbers. This goes to Mr. Robinson's point too. 25, 10, 5. 25, 10, 5. First 25 decades of this country, racialized slavery. The next 10 decades, Jim Crow or slavery by another name. Mm -hmm. That's 35 decades of the history of this country. We're only five decades of so-called freedom. Mm. So 25, 10, 5, you add that up, and then you think about all the racial rules that undergirded mm -hmm. those first 35 decades where there was, by law, no access to credit because we were the property. <laughs> yep. So then you go to the New Deal, which Dr. Mavo talked about, which we consider right an incredibly progressive moment in our history that had all these racial rules embedded. The Fair Labor Standards Act, minimum wage, National Labor Relations Act, the rights of workers to organize for the first time. Fair housing, mm -hmm. GI Bill, all excluded, Social Security in the very beginning, excluded domestic and agricultural workers. Black people. Black people at the time. Now it's interesting, right, how that's evolved, right? Because if you think of who does domestic work today and who does agricultural work today, the composition has changed a little, but it surely isn't white folks mm -hmm. for the most part. So if you look then at the question in the last five decades of, compared to the first 35, and access to capital. Clearly, this is going back to Mr. Robinson's point, there's no catching up in the race 
in the last five decades. But secondly, even with all the access to capital that black people maybe could have gotten, I'm not sure that would have been transformative for the majority of black people in America. And then that raises a question, would, is it, would we have become black capitalists in the same way or not? Would we have a different model of how to treat workers, for instance? Is there a litmus test for that when there was a dual economy in a city like Memphis doing segregation? Is that a measure of what might have happened and I, when yes. there was separate insurance systems, separate uh, merchants, separate businesses? You know, if someone was delivering wood or milk or something to your house, it probably came from the black business district as opposed to the white business district. Absolutely. Does that provide any kind of model? Absolutely. I do think access to capital is one strategy. It is not the strategy. It is not the strategy for freedom and liberation. Because we did have a huge increase, and I'm looking right in front of me at Reverend Jackson, who has spent his life fighting for access to capital and credit, particularly for black-owned businesses in my hometown of Chicago. So did it make a difference? Yes. But let's look at the data today. What are the kinds of jobs that most black workers have, mm -hmm. and even in black-owned businesses, we do have to ask ourselves a question and hold ourselves accountable. Are we paying a living wage? Ooh. Let's ask that question when we own businesses. Because I could find, I could think of at least 10 in Chicago, New York, Atlanta that are not. And that have had to, right, we've had to have a struggle to get ourselves to the highest of standards. Mm -hmm. So it is, the, it is, it is, multiple strategies here. Do we need access to capital? Yes. Do we, need, do we need to become job creators? Yes. Are we also paying a living wage when we do? Is that what you wanted to throw on the table? So the other, that, the other thing I want to throw on the table, because you brought the C word capitalism, mm -hmm. Dr. Malvo, there's this other word around empire that I want to throw on the table. Mm -hmm. And you're not talking about the Tuesday PM show. I love that show, I know. <laughs> I'm not talking about Cookie. <laughs> that show. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but we might, ask, we might ask if Empire Records actually pays a living wage. That's a good question to ask on the theme. But Dr. King talked about his, this in his, and where do we go from here, and a lot of his other work around, right, the triple evils Imperialism. around war and militarism, because he understood that capitalism and empire were connected with racism in this country, and that if we kept paying for military conflicts, we were not going to use those resources to end absolute poverty in America, which we could totally do then and we could do now. And that was an uncomfortable conversation then. Yep. And that's an uncomfortable conversation. It's an uncomfortable conversation. The, the notion that we, I mean, we built this empire, essentially. But we all, and it's a contradiction in a sense, right? Because we are part of an empire and we have made internal progress around some rights. But there is this contradiction that we're still part of an empire, and guess what? Empires don't fall from without, they usually fall from within. And we are at that point now, at that, that inflection point in history. What will we choose to do in this moment in terms of how we treat the least of these internally, as well as what we do in terms of the conflicts around the world, including some we're clearly about to get ourselves into? I just want to throw that question on the table. I'm, I'm wondering if there's a larger question. Uh, when we were closed in on our block in Richmond, Virginia, uh, I had never met a white person in my life save the one who came by to pick up our insurance premiums once a week. <laughs> and. Um, Prostitutes lived across the street. I went to the house next to mine and uh, met uh, Larry Doby, mm -hmm. who was the baseball player after Jackie Robinson, mm -hmm. who integrated the American League. My high school principal lived down the block. We were all together. Mm -hmm. uh, when I saw our lawyers, Oliver W. Hill, walk through our neighborhood, I said, there goes Mr. Hill. He's going to win us our freedom. 
but we were like one. I do think that after some of us went out and up, those of us who had education, had opportunity, and I am wondering if we fought as hard mm. for the freedom of all of us mm. as we did when we were all caved in mm -hmm. by segregation. I, who, and so the question is, who are we? Ralph Ellison said it. When I know who I am, I'll be free. I'm not sure that we know who we are. And I am sure that you need a grasp of your culture, your languages, your your everything that goes into culture. Um, and, and the things you laud, the things you love, the things that are uh, as old as history. That's what you need to know, not the flippant stuff that comes and goes, but the permanent stuff. And we can't remember Mm -hmm. But there's a way to find out. I, I think Susan Taylor is doing tremendous work with National Cares Mentoring. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because she is trying to rebuild lives of children and parents from the inside out. That's God's work. Mm -hmm. You're talking about the hidden dividend of segregation. And, and we don't talk a lot well, about Well, we that, didn't think it was a dividend then. <laughs> but, it, 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 but there was a dividend in a community where the doctors and the ditch diggers yes, sent their was. children to the same it school. Yes, it was. And when, where they, you, when they came to announce to my classroom at Benjamin Graves uh, Junior High School when I was in the ninth grade, they came to announce that Brown versus the Board of Education had been handed down. There was not a smiling face in that classroom. Oh. We were not happy about it. It's not like we didn't want to go where we wanted to go. We wanted to be free to go wherever we wanted to go. But we didn't want to be with white people any more than they wanted to be with us. Uh, so it was almost like the nerve of them to think that we wanted to be with them. No, that wasn't what was at issue. The question was, could we go any place we wanted to go? That's what freedom meant to us. And the flip side of that was, because people couldn't go anywhere they wanted to go, I just met someone from Birmingham, Alabama, where my father is from. Parker High School in Birmingham, if you took chemistry, you took it from a chemistry professor, someone who had perhaps a PhD because they could not use that PhD to go into the workforce. If you, you know, so you had teachers who were over-indexed in terms of their in education because of that, the sort of the, the pinch, the, the cement on their shoulders. I want to throw something else on the table because we're running, um, we need to be cognizant of the clock. If we're talking about equality, Dr. King was very much focused in the end of his life on poverty. Yes. On attacking poverty in America and understanding the roots of poverty. I wonder if we need to think of new, again, the glossary, and it's not as simple as this, but if it would help to think of new ways to talk about poverty, new words for poverty. When you see someone who is, you know, if we're talking about poverty, that's one thing. If you're talking about unrealized potential, that's something else. If you're, you know, if, if you change the frame of the conversation, and it may sound simplistic, but in some ways, does that change the thinking around policy? Does it change the way that people see themselves in, in the culture? Now, there's just been so much hostility toward poor people especially um, 
in the past, I'd say in, in this 21st century. We, we've seen members of Congress go to the floor of Congress and excoriate people who receive public assistance, saying things like, um, this is not someone you leave your cat with. Uh, I, I don't remember the exact quote. But Dr. King, in his Nobel Peace Prize acceptance speech, said, I have the audacity to believe that people everywhere can have three meals a day for their bodies, education and culture for their minds, peace and freedom for their spirits. So if we just start with the three meals a day, Michelle, and you talk about how we reframe poverty, how many hungry people are there in this country? I mean, you have this but thing that's an called example. food If insecurity. you're talking about poverty, if you're talking about what, what does poverty mean? Well, it's food you know, insecurity. That you're living without food. And there, and there are millions of people, tens of millions of people who of have all more colors. who have of all colors, who have more month than money, they often say. When you look at food banks, how the number of people who come to food banks spikes toward the end of the month. And the difference in the number, the kinds of people who are going to food banks, so that you're seeing more families going to food banks. You used to basically see, you know, at, at soup kitchens, men, single men generally. You wouldn't see a family, but increasingly you're seeing families who are going there. So you're talking about food, but you're also talking about shelter. Affordable housing may be one of the biggest crises in some of our inner cities. Mm -hmm. In Washington, D.C., um, as an example, the gentrification has pushed large parts of the African American community out. And um, although the mayor talks about a fair housing trust that she's put some money aside in, we haven't seen that housing stock really replace it. So where do people go? But Molly, someone in the last session talked about Molly Orshansky. Mm -hmm. She was the woman who actually invented the poverty line mm -hmm. by taking a market basket of goods, some food. Basically, she took a food basket and multiplied it by three or four and said, basically, you need three or four times whatever your food basket is. And they basically just indexed that. So you've seen a lot of pushback on the conservative side to talk about the fact that, I mean, I think that everybody just about has a telephone. So back when the poverty line was put together, everybody didn't have a telephone or a television, which again, we put right. together. So I, I mean, while there can be something very objective, I think there's always going to be something subjective about who talks about poverty and how. Because essentially, a young lady, uh, the sister who has the blog, uh, Memphis 50, mm -hmm. that if you want to Wendy. solve a problem, yes, Wendy, she said, if you want to solve a problem, don't look at who suffers from it but who benefits from it. So if you look at poverty, who gains from poverty? I mean, who makes money from poverty? Mm -hmm. And you know, we can connect this, of course, to mass incarceration by looking just at the whole bail bonds industry mm -hmm. and how you know, brothers will stay in jail seven, eight, nine, ten 10 months because someone can't come up with their bail, then take a plea, and you know, then their record is ruined for life. And you know, somebody who has means gets bailed out and it's a different situation. So, you know, really a, a systematic look at poverty would really look at who benefits from it. And we would start, you know, by looking at these mom and pop stores to have a two times markup on the corners mm -hmm. when you're in a food desert and you don't have a car and can't necessarily get to a store. In the inner city, we're talking about a mile or two or the fact that people don't have transportation to go. But in rural areas, we're talking about you're not with a store within five miles. So people don't have, so I mean, I think we could go back and look at Orshansky's work and tease it back out to say who is the beneficiary in terms of housing, in terms of food, um, even in terms of education as we look at this charter school system. Dr. King dealt with education. Who, you know, who has the means to buy out of a poor school system? Uh, who has the means to take a public school and augment what they offer? We've seen this with our parent organizations in Washington yeah. where in Ward 3, which is where the rich people live, now their, their PTAs have hundreds of thousands of dollars to add for swimming coaches, this and that. Additional teachers. And in the hood, the PTA may have $300 uh, to try to get folks to a mm -hmm. field trip. So, you know, I mean, it's an interesting question you're raising, but what I think it really does raise is a possibility of studies that really ask who benefits and then how do we manage them? Capitalism, I look at capitalism as a wolf. And I look at government regulation as a dentist. Mm -hmm. In other words, a wolf is going to claw up everything it can if given the opportunity. But the dentist files the teeth. Mm -hmm. So that capitalism would not be so predatory if the tooth file was a little better. President Johnson filed the teeth um, to make, mm -hmm. but now this person, um, 45, he's sharpening the teeth. 
So I would say, oh, go on, wolf, eat everything you can, and then some. Go on and decimate as many communities and people as you can, and then some. So getting rid of Dodd-Frank, as an example, disempowers consumers. Mm -hmm. Having a, a, a regulation that says that restaurant owners can take the people's tips. And this is a proposed regulation that if you leave a tip on the table, the owner can take the tip and distribute it or keep it. Um, so I mean, those are the kind of things that are predatory. And that's giving the wolf teeth as opposed to filing the teeth down. The reason I ask the question, and I'll, I'll say this in closing just to give people something to think about about a new word for poverty is I actually, through my work in the Race Car Project, I do these oral histories, and I met someone. Um, she was a Caucasian woman and had you know, gotten used to people calling her white trash all her life and didn't feel good. And in order to figure out how to get out from under that kind of judgment, she said whenever she looked at a sentence that had poverty in it or had the word poor in it or poor as an adjective, she decided that she would try to reconfigure that sentence to try to force people to say what they were really trying to say. Mm. So when you say someone is poor, what, is it you're, what are you really trying to say about that person? Are you saying that they're poor in judgment or poor in character? Are you saying that they live in substandard housing, that they don't have adequate education, that they don't have? So it's really made me think about some of these things and to really put a, a, a more specific point on that. And, and whenever I think about this, I, I think about that conversation. Can I just share quickly this quote from Dr. King? Because of all the things people quote, I never, I rarely see this, and it's his moral articulation of the problem of poverty. And it's always compelling to me. He writes, the curse of poverty of has no, just, no justification in our age. It is socially as cruel and blind as the practice of cannibalism mm -hmm. at the dawn of civilization, when men ate each other because they had not yet learned to take food from the soil or to consume the abundant animal life around them. The time has come for us to civilize ourselves by the total, direct, and immediate abolition of poverty. We have yet to civilize ourselves. And that is a moral issue, and we have lost our way. That's a great quote. Okay. Dorian, Julianne, Randall, thank you very much. A few housekeeping matters. We're concluded for this panel. Um, we've reached our conclusion, but we still have um, miles to go, and a few miles to go before we eat. So, pardon? Oh, we can, oh, oh okay, I thought, we, I thought we, we actually have a little bit more time, because I thought we were, we have a, an, another 10 minutes, so we can actually oh, continue. Cool Good. <laughs> so, um, we talked about incarceration in the last panel, and if we're talking about uh, inequality, and trying to interrogate systems of inequality, I want to give this panel a chance to take that on as well. Because that's, uh, it's hard to find Dr. King writing specifically about this because uh, we saw there was um, slavery by another name in, mm -hmm. in terms of convict labor, but not the kind of you know, mass incarceration that we see today. The prison industrial complex was nothing like what we've seen. How does that contribute to the systems of inequality that we see today, the mass incarceration rate? And I want to talk about men going in and increasingly now women, but also on the other side of that, the world that they, that they enter. Re-entry is something that we don't spend nearly enough time talking about. We're right in the middle of it, if you do the math. You know, the, the, the mandatory minimums that were put in place 25, 28 years ago, Many of those young men are now coming out into a society that is not yet ready to embrace them, going back into communities that in some cases have changed. It's interesting in Washington, D.C., going back to neighborhoods they no longer recognize because of the gentrification that's happened in Washington, D.C., in Brooklyn, in Nashville, in a neighborhood that the yuppies now call East Nasty, which used mm. to be called East Nashville, which is mm. now hip and, you know, and, and, and expensive. Mm. So if we could talk a little bit about the Im impact of incarceration on the rate, on, um, on the systems of inequality. Julianne. Uh, you know, I would want to start by talking about women, because so mm -hmm. much of the conversation about um, mass incarceration really focuses on men. And we've seen about an 800% increase in the incarceration of African-American women. Almost half of these women are mothers. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them actually give birth 
in jail. Actually, a large number of them. And, and then what happens, you know, it's, so you're now, not only are you incarcerating a woman, but you're incarcerating a child because that child more than likely will go to foster care. And the African-American children disproportionately populate foster care. And foster care for many is a very inhumane system. There's a very a large amount of abuse in, in some of those systems. And then what is going on with these women? We haven't really looked carefully. We spent a lot of time again, and I, you know, incarceration of anyone, I mean, is an abomination, especially when you look at why are you incarcerated? What is the purpose of incarceration? It's supposed to be rehabilitation. It's not supposed to be punishment. Well, punishment is you're away from your effects, but it's supposed to be rehabilitation. They've taken education out of the prisons. Uh, there was a time when folks got degrees while they were incarcerated. That's happened a lot less uh, because of basically funding challenges and all of that. So, and then you have the, the uh, discrimination against people who've been incarcerated. And so when you look at that, these people are almost being consigned to poverty unless we decide to develop robust reentry programs, mm -hmm. and especially for some of these women. Um, and reunification programs for them to get back with their children. And we seem to just turn a blind eye to it. It seems to make us all very uncomfortable, especially we talk about what happens to women and men, but I, a lot, rape for women in prisons mm -hmm. and men. But again, I'm, I, want, I want us to think when we think about increasingly in the African-American community, I think that we really do need to have a much more holistic view um, of what's going on. With Black Lives Matter, the focus on men. For every, you know, one woman is killed for every three men who are killed, but these, we, we can't call their names like we can call the names of uh, Alter Sterling or Stefan um, Clark, who was just uh, massacred. I got a text from someone earlier that said that some a black man to, uh, yesterday was uh, shot in a store here in Memphis, in North Memphis. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Repeat that. Dorian Harris. Mm -hmm. Okay, Dorian Harris? Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, and that, that hasn't made the headlines, so that we don't always make headlines, but the young girl who spoke at um, the Our Lives Matter march, the young black girl who said black women's uh, names I, don't I'm, make the headlines. I'm here to speak for black women. And, and that was, that was just amazing, taken. but I encourage us all to think more intersectionally about what's happening in our community because it, happen, it happens to men and it happens to women. And the incarceration of women often um, comes with an unfairness around it because often these are mothers, daughters, sisters, wives who have shielded the men and then get, are the ones who get the punishment. There was a case about 20 years ago, it was a long time ago, of an older black woman who, she was a cougar, and the young boy was a drug dealer. And so the drug dealer's suitcase full of drugs was found in a cougar's house and a cougar went to jail. And you know, people might say, you know, she was a fool for a man, but you know, most women have been fooled for a man at least once. And uh, <laughs> they, didn't get, they didn't get twitted to life for it. So you know, we have to look at the, some of this stuff you know, very intersectionally. So just two quick points on, on that. Um, what we know is the system of mass incarceration, instead of producing returning citizens mm -hmm. to communities, mm -hmm. it is really social, economic, and political death. Mm -hmm. Yes. You can't vote. There's an effort now to reverse this in Florida. There's a ballot referendum, right. the Florida Rights and Restoration Coalition. You can't vote. You can't get access to jobs. You can't get access to housing. That's social, economic, political death. On the other hand, what we also know about race in this country, this is a famous book by Lonnie Guineer and Joe Torres, The Miner's Canary, but black people, and particularly black women, are the miner's canary of American democracy. So what often happens to us first happens to the rest of the country. So if you look at deindustrialization, automation in the 70s and 80s, that just left, especially northern cities, you have an influx of drugs, combined with new laws, right, creating a system of mass incarceration, then, you, then black folks get swept up. Well, what has happened now, and I'm reminded of a story, I went to Ohio last year and was touring the state, and I asked an, organizing, an organizer buddy of mine, well, what's, what's going on here around criminal justice? And he said, no, it's really interesting, Dorian, the fastest rate of incarceration in the state is white rural women. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. What are you talking about? Deindustrialization, lack of jobs, the influx of drugs, opioids. Mm -hmm. Mm. Laws designed for another purpose are now sweeping up mm -hmm. white rural women. Miner's canary, right? So 30 years ago, when we were protesting and organizing and screaming, no one wanted to listen, but now it's happening to the rest of America. So in some ways, it's, you know, it's not that it's fitting, but it creates an interesting possibility for a political coalition. This is precisely what Dr. King was doing in terms of the Poor People's Campaign, right, of what, envisioning what is the multiracial movement that could be transformative. And on the question of mass incarceration, I do think there is something going on in terms of building a multiracial coalition mm -hmm. of people affect, now that it's affecting a broader group of folks, that could potentially be transformative. The politics is quickly shifting on this mm -hmm. question. They're so much more punitive towards um, crack, yep. you know, towards the opioids. Yep. I mean, there's a sheriff in Massachusetts, if you're opioid addicted, he's, he probably, uh, you can go wherever, you can go there from wherever, and he's promised to get you help. He will make sure that you get a rehab program. Nobody ever wants to do that mm -hmm. for crack. So I'm not so sure about the possibility of coalition when the crack people, some of them are still incarcerated. Well, there's, there's a ballot referendum also right now in the state of Ohio that will mm -hmm. be on the ballot this fall that will totally transform the criminal justice system. Really? A majority of voters have to vote for it. So this is the time to organize and to create the political will to actually transform the system so that the black folks still in there actually can be returning citizens at some point. So last thing I want to ask you is since we're thinking about Dr. King's legacy, what about his legacy should we pay more attention to? What don't we know about Dr. King? Um, I've been thinking a lot about how legacy is made. You know, it, and, and it was decided very quickly upon his death. There was, there was literally a group of historians who got together and said, we're going to decide how we're going to tell the story. And it's to your point about culture and the stories that we tell each other and the stories that we tell our children. The quote that you regaled us with, that you shared with us, there are lots of books mm -hmm. of quotes of Dr. King. You can go to websites. You can, there's a whole Pinterest page or maybe 12 that have all, you're not going to find that quote. No. You know, you're not going to find him talking about cannibalism. Um, so just each of you quickly, Randall, I want to begin with you. Something well, about the, Dr. King's legacy. I think the question is, more attention. the question is always, who I am inside. And I am my parents' child. My brother was my parents' child. My sisters were my parents' child. And we were formed by them. But they had enough, because of the church, really, I think that my grandmother's on both sides. My grandparents on my mother's side sent five girls to college at Virginia Union University, mm. bonking in with us when I was a child because that was important to them. But my grandfather, although he was poor, just like my grandmother on my father's side, was poor. She was a maid in a big house down on Monument Avenue. But she had, she had a good soul and she had a proper belief in who she was. Decent people. Well, everybody doesn't have that chance. Everybody didn't get that. I, I, I knew a kid once who, who, uh, who held up uh, a grocery store and killed a woman. Mm. He was the nicest guy in the world. But he didn't have the same chance that I had. And I understood that from the very beginning. I think it's a very important that we do some renovation from the inside out mm -hmm. um, so that um, whether we are not the richest people in the world, and now we have a very rich person in the White House, 
and he is wretched from the inside. That's kind. Um, and I think that we can do more collaboratively as a people to remember who we once were and who we can be again. And to, 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 to do this thing with, uh, with great zest, uh, to rebuild us as a community. To look inward first. To look, I think you have to look inward to look outward. To look inward. Quickly, each of you, something that we should remember about Dr. King's legacy. I think we want to put the legacy in context. Mm -hmm. um, the first thing I would say is I think Dr. King was an economist because that's just a uh, professional uh, whatever, um, just being an economist. I think he was an economist. But he talked about economic structuring constantly. Mm -hmm. uh, even the people remember the um, I have a dream speech, but let's not forget that paragraph. We have come to the nation's capital mm -hmm. to cash a check, and that check has been marked insufficient, insufficient funds. funds. And again and again and again, he talks about the economy, and so I think we want to look at the issue of economic restructuring. I think also, uh, I got to give a shout out to Reverend Jackson, who is here, because I think he is a living embodiment in so many ways of Dr. King's legacy with what he's done um, with Rainbow Push and continue to do. And those who would celebrate Dr. King would do well to look at Rainbow Push and the work that we do. And I would say I'm the pre president of Push Excel, which is an education arm, and we raise money to give scholarships given millions of dollars of scholarships to students. But you know, when people want to talk about celebrating Dr. King, look at the way that, that Reverend Jackson through the Wall Street Project has really attempted to make corporate America accountable. And Silicon uh, Valley as well. And, and Silicon Valley, and, and, so, and Peachtree Street in Atlanta, so many other places, the auto industry. And so again, I would just tell people, emphasize the economic legacy of Dr. King, which is really about distribution. Who gets what, when, where, and why, which is what uh, economists really look at. And it doesn't mean to, I, don't mean, I know you want me to stop, I'll just say one thing. You said you wanted to be um, optimistic. I'm optimistic about our futures. I'm not optimistic about closing the gap. Mm. I mean, I don't think that, you know, absent reparations, we will not close the gap. But I am optimistic about the ways those young people uh, last week made me extraordinarily optimistic with the, with the march that they had. Thank you. I would say really quickly, uh, people say the man made the movement, but the movement actually made the man. Mm. And we ignore, we think of Dr. King as a static figure. We ignore all his interlocutors and his engagement. If you think of a young John Lewis or a young Jesse Jackson or an Ella Baker or a Diane Nash or Stokely, mm. there is a lot happening in this moment. And he is evolving. He is not the same yeah. king in 68 as he was in 55 in terms of the evolution of his political analysis and his strategy. So I think the question as we think about his legacy is, which king do you choose to honor? And which king do you choose to ignore? Mm. That is the question, I think, for all of us as we go forward. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> that's, a great, that's a great way to Dorian, end. Dorian, Julianne, Randall. Thank you very much. It's now time. We um, have a few miles to go before we eat. Uh, there are buses downstairs that will take you to the Holiday Inn for lunch. If you choose to walk, it's a quick walk. I'm told it's only about four minutes. And there are guides who will make sure that you get there um, easily and on time. Thank you very much. Um, we'll enjoy Taylor Branch, and then we'll come back for our next panel. <laughs>